Jamie Kerchick, welcome on the bus. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, thank you. Journalist, author, and uh, I don't know the proper term is because I looked you up on the Brookings Institution. You got me on that one. But expert, you know, fellow. Expert is a, expert is a word to use lightly. <laughs> And I mean, first of all, before I go into what you did at the Brookings Institute, what is the Brookings Institution? And I said Institute again, right? The Brookings, there. I, I, the only reason why I, I um, nail you on that is because my first job in journalism was at the New Republic magazine, and I was a fact checker. And one of the first things I learned was it's the Brookings Institution, not the Brookings Institute. So that's, I guess that's why I'm a stickler. <laughs> um, the Brookings Institution is a what's known as a think tank, uh, it's, a, it's a private, non profit nonpartisan or uh, institution organization that uh, provides analysis of public policy questions, uh, domestic and foreign policy. I'm in the foreign policy side. But uh, Brookings, is, I think, is probably regarded as the, the first think tank mm -hmm. in America. It was founded in um, 1916, yeah. just celebrated our 100th anniversary recently, and um, is widely regarded as really the sort of the top, I would say, nonpartisan uh, think tank. What would be some other think tanks that uh, with the oh, similar Oh, well, names we're on Massachusetts Avenue in Washington, and it's sort of known as Think Tank Row. You have the American Enterprise Institute, which is a conservative think tank. Then there's the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, which is another uh, It's a more um, foreign policy-focused think tank. You have the Heritage Foundation, which is, um, I would say, a more kind of movement conservative think tank. Heard there's the... Center for American Progress, which is relatively new, and that's probably the biggest liberal think tank. I think it was that was founded, I think, explicitly to sort of uh, modeled on the heritage model. So whereas, whereas Brookings is more down the middle, you know, heritage is more I ideological. It was founded in the 70s and kind of paved the way for the Reagan Revolution. And you had lots of scholars and lots of ideas that came out of heritage being made into policy by the Reagan administration. CAP, Center for American Progress, is sort of modeled on heritage, but from the left. And then there's, I mean, it's probably something like, I don't know, it's probably like 5,000 think tanks in Washington alone. You have them all over on every conceivable subject, regional, in terms of foreign policy, you have regional think tanks, think tanks that focus on Russia or Africa or the Caucasus or China. You have, and then you have domestic policy think tanks that, you know, education policy, social policy, and then across the country in um, states, there, there are state-level think tanks. So, um, you know, in like the Wisconsin Public Policy Institute. I don't know, I'm just making that up. There probably is something called the Wisconsin <laughs> yeah. Public Policy Institute. And around the world you have them. I mean, the most well-known overseas would probably be um, Chatham House in London, which is, I think, maybe the oldest think tank in the world. It's an international relations uh, think tank. And they're really, they're all, they're all over the place. Yeah. What's so different about, like, yours being nonpartisan or not, basically non-biased? You know, you, mm. you're not left-leaning or right-leaning. And then, you know, these left-leaning or right-leaning mm. ones... Is it just confirming biases from you know these different sides that say, hey, well, we, we did our notes from here because this is how we see the world. And this That's is a good question. I think those sorts of think tanks, the ones that are more explicitly biased, perhaps have more of a, a mission to provide certain solutions that conform to a particular ideology. So, you know, Heritage is, is going to have free market, you know, solutions to problems. They're going to call for less regulation. Whereas CAP is going to call for, you know, presumably more regulation. They're going to be more, um, you know, liberal, capital L, liberal, pro-democratic party in their prescriptions um, because the people who work there and the mission of the organization is to supply the left with ideas, whereas for Heritage it's to supply the right with ideas. I think whereas Brookings, um, obviously everyone who works there has their own beliefs about certain issues, but I think there's more of an understanding that we're not there to provide, you know, answers or ideas to a particular party but we're really there to just provide you know analysis that anyone can use and that's certainly how i see my job and i think most of my colleagues would agree with that uh, characterization so you're in foreign policy and what you study over there i mean what's what are you working on right now what are you researching what are you looking at oh uh so i'm at something called the center on the united states in europe and we focus on transatlantic relations on europe on russia that whole region, um, and it's keeping us very busy, as you can imagine, because there's a lot going on. Yeah. Um, and so I'm constantly, you know, writing articles on various topics, op-eds, longer essays, book reviews. Um, we have multiple meetings with basically anyone who's coming through Washington who's a 
a European delegation, a European minister, government minister, or fellow think tankers from other think tanks, or members of you know parliament from various European countries. They come to Washington to have meetings at the State Department, and they'll they'll come to Brookings and do a briefing with us. So we're we're you know we're keeping apprised of what's going on in the transatlantic relationship. Yeah, how are relations right now? I mean, with the uh, the current administration, everything's yeah. kind of. It's one way or it's the other way. It's good or it's really bad. It's hard to tell. We actually just started something called the Transatlantic Scorecard, where every <laughs> <laughs> every four months, all the scholars in our department um, basically give a rating on a certain index of, you know, like, how do you judge economic relations between Europe and America? How do you judge the security relationship, the political relationship, and whatnot? Um, I have to say I'm less, I'm more sanguine than I think most analysts, I think, just because over the past two years, I've come to realize that um, there's the president who sometimes says crazy things and tweets crazy things and behaves in a very uncouth and insulting manner. Mm -hmm. And then there's the actual policies that are carried out by the U.S. government, and they're often not the same. And I think a lot of analysts get kind of caught up in, so for instance, the Helsinki press conference with Vladimir Putin a couple months ago, where he you know, very famously sort of took the word of Vladimir Putin over that of our own intelligence agencies on the question of whether or not the Russians interfered in the election. And there were lots of other sort of embarrassments in his behavior at the NATO summit a couple of days before. He had, you know, he started off the meeting with the NATO secretary general demanding that European allies pay more money. And they said, we're going to meet the 2% threshold. And then at the end of the, at the end of the summit, he says, oh, I want it to be 4% of GDP. I mean, he just behaved like a, a brute. And I think a lot of analysts kind of get kind of hung up on his behavior, and they kind of miss the forest for the trees. Because if you actually look at, you know, the U.S. relationship with NATO, we're actually increasing our support for NATO. We have, you know, we're sending more troops to Eastern Europe. We're selling weapons to Ukraine to, so they can defend themselves against the Russians, which Barack Obama wouldn't do. Um, and so I think, it, yeah, I, I mean, I, transatlantic relations are not good; they're quite bad. They're probably certainly, I would say, probably worse than they were during the last period of real transatlantic rift, which was over the Iraq war. I think this is a deeper problem just because Trump himself, as an individual, is very ideologically opposed or d doesn't really see the worth of the transatlantic relationship. He doesn't understand it. And that's a new thing to have an American president, really, since, 19, since Harry Truman, you know, since the end of World War II. Every American president has been committed to... Uh, European unity, so whether it was the European community in the aftermath of World War II, it later became the European Union. We've supported the European Union, the existence of it, the spread of it. We've supported NATO, and we've supported um, basically, you know, uh, keeping the Russians in their place so that they're not causing trouble in Europe. And now we have a president who, you know, during the campaign, he would attack NATO and say it's not worth it and we're not going to defend our allies, even though we have a treaty obligation to do so. He attacked the EU. He supported Brexit. He's you know, given vocal support to various far-right leaders in Europe, like Marine Le Pen in France. And then there's the whole Russia question, which we still don't know the answer to. But like, clearly he has very, um, how should I put it, um, non-traditional views of mm -hmm. America's relationship with Russia. So to have a guy like this as president, I think, is deeply worrying to many Europeans. They don't understand if this is, you know, just a... Is it just a flash in the pan, or is it an actual, you know, is this going to be, is, is America going to be like this forever? Um, and I think that's causing a lot of disruption, a lot of concern. It's leading some Europeans to say, you know, we have to kind of finish with America. We have to move on. We can't depend on them anymore. The old way of doing business is over. We need to be, you know, strategically autonomous is the expression you hear, the term you hear. Um, I think it's still a little early to say that because I, Again, you know, just because we have this president who says these things doesn't necessarily mean that all of his kind of kooky ideas are going to be implemented into policy. So I would just, you know, that's that's sort of how I warn people when it, whenever they're dealing or whenever they're trying to analyze what's going on with this presidency to just kind of take a step back and say, yes, he's saying ridiculous, silly, stupid things. But, you know, is it actually having an effect on policy? Sometimes it does. I mean, one example where it does, I think, matter is, you know, Article 5 of the NATO Charter. This is the Collective Defense Clause. It basically says an attack on one member of NATO is an attack on all. And uh, that has only been invoked once in the history of NATO. And that was after 9-11, when the United States was attacked by al-Qaeda. 
And the next day, all of our NATO allies got together in Brussels and said, this is an attack on all of us. And they went into Afghanistan. And, you know, the mission in Afghanistan, the war in Afghanistan, was initially a NATO mission. And so whenever I would hear Donald Trump say, you know, what has NATO done for us? Why are we, why are we protecting these countries that don't do anything for us? I, it would annoy me because the only time that this collective defense treaty that he was invoking has ever actually been invoked was in defense of the United States by our NATO allies. So when you, when you, and, and the reason why that worked during the Cold War, the reason why the Rus- we didn't have a war in Europe after the after World War II, the reason the Soviets didn't get into a war with us, one of the reasons is because we had NATO, and because the Russians believed that if they you know crossed that line into West Germany, uh, that there'd be hell to pay, so to speak. We had nuclear missiles, and I mean it was a real commitment. Um, and they believed it, and it kept the peace in Europe, and it's kept the peace in Europe ever since. There's never been a conventional attack on a NATO member. So when you have the president of the United States, okay, the leader of the free world, openly saying, you know, I don't know if we're going to defend these countries unless they pay up, or when he's asked by Tucker Carlson about Montenegro, which is a new member of NATO, and he says things like, well, those Montenegrins are really aggressive and they might start us, you know, start World War III and get us involved. That really sends a bad message to the Russians because deterrence depends on credibility. You have to believe the threat. And, you know, I question, I think there are serious questions about whether or not um, Donald Trump would honor America's defense commitments if one of our NATO allies was attacked by Russia or some other power. Well, help us better understand what the underlying mechanisms for him disregarding the transatlantic alliance would be. What do you mean? By that? So, so what is it? What is it about Trump and his presidency that he's willing to disregard that? Like, mm, why doesn't he find right. value? Right. Uh, well, I would say that Donald Trump is sort of surprising and strange as he appears to many of us. Actually, does come from a very long sort of tradition in American foreign policy, and you could say it's a Jacksonian tradition. Uh, going back to Andrew Jackson, which is sort of a, um, you know, fighting for the common man, uh, nationalism, and wanting a, a strong America, but, in, but an America that really sort of takes care of itself first, America first. We've heard America first before. It was, you know, infamously Charles Lindbergh, the pilot, mm. who was a Nazi supporter. <laughs> um, before World War II, the America first movement. But the America first movement actually had, until Pearl Harbor, the America First movement was actually a very broad-based movement. You had liberals, you had conservatives, you had Democrats, you had Republicans, people of all different walks of life. Because after World War One, they didn't want to get involved in another European war. And so the America First movement was actually quite, um, you could say, mainstream until we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. And then it basically withered away. And the only people supporting it at that point were kind of outright, you know, Nazi supporters. Um, but Trump comes from that tradition. It's, it's always been there in American history. You could see it through, you know, Robert Taft. You could see it through the isolationist movement. I would say Ron Paul and Rand Paul, uh, a family that I've had some experience with as a journalist, (laughs) they um, would carry that tradition into the present day. And then Trump comes along. And so he definitely, you know, it's not like he came out of nowhere. There's definitely that sort of sentiment, particularly on the right, on the American right, that um, supports a strong military but only wants to use it when America's attacked. And believes in alliances, but um, has the feeling that American alliances are not, um, haven't been as worth it to us as, as perhaps they've been portrayed as. And so that's where he comes on saying, you know, he doesn't under, he, he doesn't, he sees alliances as being more of a burden than an asset. So the fact that we have, you know, military bases in like something like 150 countries around the world, the fact that we have NATO, the fact that we have very strong defense relationships with Japan and South Korea and Taiwan, countries in Asia. He doesn't see this, what's been called as you know, the liberal world order. This is the, the order that America constructed after World War II, which is basically having this globe-spanning network of alliances and military commitments and uh, military bases and diplomatic relationships and trading agreements. The United Nations is a part of this liberal world order. NATO is a part of it. He sees this as basically, you know, tying us down and not, as I would see it, and I think most foreign policy analysts who are, you know, in the mainstream, whether they're conservative or liberal, have seen this generally as being a good thing for America and the world. It's basically prevented great power conflict. We haven't had great power conflict since World War II. There hasn't been a major war between the United States 
and China or Russia or major powers. It's been small wars. And I think that's because of this liberal world order. And Trump doesn't see that. He doesn't believe it. So from the very, I mean, you, this goes back decades, really, to the 1980s when he was paying for full-page advertisements in the New York Times saying that you know, oh. our, our relationship with Japan was a waste of money. And we're subsidizing, you know, this was back when, before China became a huge power, everyone thought Japan was going to overtake America. And so, you know, why are we subsidizing Japan through our defense commitment and they're going to overtake us, the auto industry, they're flooding us with cars, blah, blah, blah. That's what he thought about Japan. Um, and so now he comes, you know, and he, he doesn't see value in NATO. He just doesn't, I don't think he has the historical conception or understanding of, um, of what these alliances mean. And I, I would also think that it's hard for him and other people to understand what the alternative is. I mean, you can rack up all the costs. You can point to, yes, it costs this much to station our troops in Europe, and it costs this much to have this many aircraft carriers in the South China Sea. And, you know, it can, it's very expensive to maintain this liberal world order. It's harder to convince people or to show people what the cost would be of not having it. And in my mind, the cost of not having it would be, you know, Russian troops running across Europe eating up all the croissants. War, yeah. <laughs> that's my, that's how I see it, or the Chinese invading Taiwan. And, but that's happening uh, with China, especially the one belt, one road policy. That's a, that's a um, economic, um, a grand economic plan that they have. But yes, the Chinese are becoming much more aggressive. The Chinese want to be a global power. They're building a blue water navy, which means that they can have aircraft carriers that can go quite far out into the, into the seas. So yes, they're going to be challenged. That's the long-term challenge for us. I think actually Trump, if there's one thing I would say that he is actually sees and understands is that China is a long-term threat really. to the United States and on both sides of the aisle, more on the Democratic side. But also there are many, Rep you know, Henry Kissinger, those sorts of types of people who have basically been saying, you know, China will rise peacefully and we need to integrate them into our system and they'll eventually become democratic or if we have better, if we have more economic relations with them, then they'll become you know, amenable to this liberal world order that we've created. And I think we've seen that's completely false. The Chinese are actually, they're a revisionist power. They don't like this dispensation that they've been forced to contend with. They think it's pulling them down. And they want to kick the United States out of Asia. Mm -hmm. And they want to be able to dominate that region. And they've been, you know, they have been cheating on trade. They have been stealing intellectual property. They've been doing all these things that Trump has said. You know, whether or not the policy that he's pursued in, in kind of, taking them on. I, I can't say if that's wise or not. I'm not an Asia expert. But um, um, it would be easier to do that, I think, if we had if if we have allies. And I think that's one of the things that I think Trump doesn't understand, which is that to be a strong power in, in the world, you need alliances. You need partners and allies to help you, to work with you. With similar, with similar values, too. Ideally, yes. Um, oftentimes, I think as we're seeing now this week with Saudi Arabia, you're going to have allies who are uh, fundamentally opposed to your, to your values. And throughout the Cold War, we had this conundrum too, right? I mean, we were fighting a global war against communism. And in many places, that led us to support, you know, right-wing military dictators. And in some cases, perhaps it was the best of bad options. In some cases, it, you know, it wasn't. And we were complicit in, in immoral, you know, acts and deeds that, that we should be ashamed of. Um, but yes, I would say that, you know, what's unique about the sort of American empire, if you want to call it that, or the American liberal world order is that it is largely, um, liberal powers. And I think that's why the transatlantic relationship is so important, which is that, you know, Europe is the largest collection of democratic states in the world. The EU, they're all, you have to be a democratic, a liberal democracy to be in the EU. And so anything that the United States wants to accomplish in the world that's of real meaning or import, it has to do with the Europeans. If it's going to be, you know, an Iran nuclear deal, if it's going to be some kind of humanitarian intervention in Libya, if it's going to be dealing with the rising China, we have to do it with, with the Europeans. Um, and you want to do it with people who share your values. You're not going to agree with them all the time. I mean, Lord knows we have many disagreements with, with the Europeans on all sorts of issues, and they have disagreements with us. But at the end of the day... We have far more in common, I would argue, than, than we do that differentiates us. And so I think that's why it's important to, to work with Europe and to maintain the transatlantic alliance. I think it's been the bedrock of sort of global peace and stability and prosperity since 1945. And, um, you know, I think Trump is, he doesn't seem to change much his personal attitudes on these things. You know, he's still saying, 
you know, Brexit was a good thing and Merkel's destroying Germany and, you know, he still kind of says the same things over and over again. But there are good people in the administration below the president, whether it's in the State Department or the National Security Council or the Defense Department. There are, there are very fine people working in this administration who do have a kind of classical, traditional understanding of why these relationships um, are important. And that's why I, I encourage them to stay in the administration and not resign and protest as other people have been calling upon them to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, James Mattis is a great character to uh, have in place. And I would agree. Yeah, kind of uh, <laughs> <laughs> not, not conflicting with Trump's policy because like everything you just said, you know, he goes, he gets a 2% for uh, the NATO allies mm -hmm. to contribute, and then I want 4%. It's kind of like, I got to show this glare. I got to show that I'm fighting yeah. for everybody. Right. We want more and more and more. But at the same time, you know, you have the think tanks where mm -hmm. you work at and all these different liber uh, liberal or uh, right, right leaning ones where a lot of these people consult and advise, you know, a lot of people get their documents and research in order mm -hmm. to create policy. So as much as we like to think, you know, that these guys, you know, may be out of touch or they don't know, as politicians I'm uh, saying, they're still being advised by some of the best people who read and study up on all these things. So those those things are in place, but, you know, it, it was interesting what you said about the, um, the amount of uh, values, how we want to, you know, link up with these different... Um, countries who have the same value mm. systems that we have because you know like you said it's a it's a russia or it's a china and what happened in ukraine like hasn't happened itself since you know right. world war ii that right. they came in and just said we're gonna take this country yeah uh, annex it mm -hmm. and that's it mm -hmm. it's over it's done mm -hmm. with and there's that disconnect because so many people you know we we have the ability to connect with people through you know social media the internet but going out traveling and seeing the world and experience it really really get you out there to see oh wow i can go to any place in the country at least i've been to it and i'm going to get someone who speaks english to me if i want to order at a restaurant i want to talk with somebody they're probably going to have a second or third language and have a good understanding of english i mean you could thank the british for that mm. i don't know which way but there's a self-loathing on the left and the right it says you know oh i don't like the american empire we don't do anything good and mm. this happens and that happens they don't get to see yeah. the you know the the movement and flow of humans around the world due to the safety and security yeah. that happens. And, you know, if you get a China or Russia doing that, absolutely, it's a little different. And with Russia, do you think that um, this is just like a flex or is, you know, are they on the come up again of... Russia is a declining power in every measure, just in terms of their population size, you know, the, the um, life expectancy is declining, the size of the population is declining. Their economy is completely not modernizing. There's still, you know, a, uh, a um, extractive economy, basically, you know, subsisting on on natural resources. They're a natural resource-based economy, which is a very kind of rudimentary economy. They don't have high tech um, like a lot of their neighbors do. Um, so eventually, they're going to run out of oil. Um, that's all they have. They still have just because they're a declining power doesn't mean that they don't have the ability to cause a lot of problems. And I think we've seen that. I mean, as you said, you know, perpetrating the first armed annexation of territory on European soil since World War II is a big deal. They're waging a war in eastern Ukraine as we speak. They're meddling in Western democracies uh, in their politics. They meddled in our politics to an unprecedented degree in 2016. So they're certainly capable of causing problems. Um, and I think we've seen throughout history, actually, that often it's the declining powers that can that can be the real, you know, spark of, of international conf conflagration. What would be a, another I, one, real quick, of uh, another example of a? Well, you could say the Ottomans, perhaps um, they were a declining power before World War One. Mm -hmm. um, so this is there's something there we need to be concerned about them, and I think what the what Russians have shown is that. You know they haven't really gotten over the fact that they lost the Cold War. It's that simple. They just don't. They don't like the people running the country, namely Vladimir Putin. Felt humiliated, um, and they feel that Russia has a right to be a great power. Which, by which I mean, Russia has a right to dictate uh, the foreign policy decisions of its neighbors. That Russia has a right to basically control the countries in its periphery. They want to exert. Um, they, they want to be an empire again. That doesn't mean they want to march their troops across Europe and you know conquer Poland, but it does mean that they want to have a say. I would say a veto over anything that happens in that part of the world, and that's fundamentally something that I think the United States and its allies can't countenance because 
we won the Cold War, and, I, and that doesn't just mean that you know we get to like wave a flag in front of their face. Winning the Cold War come meant that small countries in Europe get to have their own individual freedom and sovereignty and d- decision making. And just because you're a small country doesn't mean you get to have foreign troops that you don't want just you know invade you and take you over. Every conflict in the 20th century, every major world conflict in the 20th century was sparked by border disputes in Europe. World War I had to do with, you know, was sparked by Serbian nationalism in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. World War II was obviously, you know, German expansionism annexing territory left and right. And then what was the Cold War? The Cold War was basically over the question of, you know, does Russia get to control half of Eastern Europe? Does Russia get to control Poland and the Baltic states and Romania and Bulgaria? in Czechoslovakia and all these countries. And after these three major conflicts, uh, the liberal powers, by which I would say the liberal Atlantic powers, you know, Britain, America, France, they won. And their vision of the world won. And the vision, their vision of the world you can trace to, you know, you can go back to the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson after World War I, which is saying, you know, all you know, national liberation movements and people in small countries get to have independence. These empires are breaking up. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Russian Empire, the Tsarist, Empire, Prussia, they're all breaking up and we're going to give all these people independence. Then that was thwarted in World War II. And then after World, and then after the Cold War, which is, you could say even was kind of a World War III, um, the, the liberal powers won in each of those decisive battles. And so to me, that means that if, you know, if Poland wants to join the EU and NATO, it gets to join the EU and NATO. If the Baltic states want to join the EU and NATO, they get to do it as well. And the Russians don't have a right to tell those countries that you can't do these things. That's what we fought the Cold War for. Mm. And so it, you know, it annoys me to hear people say today, well, you know, we need to be more respectful of Russia and its, you know, its feelings of uh, insecurity. We shouldn't provoke them. It was a mistake to expand NATO after, after the Cold War. I mean, I'm sorry. Like, their system lost. And it wasn't just Marxist-Leninism. It wasn't just communism that lost. It was the idea that big countries get to dictate to little countries mm-hmm. how to live their lives. Yeah, no, it's it's fascinating from my perspective. It's it's well, not only has democracy won and it seems to be continuously winning, but it's the cooperation level that's winning, right? It's it's countries that can cooperate on a bigger scale. But that's why it's so fascinating that Europe is seems like it's coming apart. It's that this cooperation maybe isn't isn't working. I mean, well, that, I wouldn't say democracy seems to be working. Um, I think that was one of the big misconceptions we had in the 1990s after. The collapse of communism, which is that democracy was, you know, the famous uh, Francis Fukuyama book, The End of History, that this was just everyone had, you know, come around to realizing that democracy was the best way of government. I think we're seeing there's two phenomena here. One is yeah. democracies themselves are becoming less democratic in some places or less liberal, I would say. There are checks and balance. You're seeing, you know, pop- what is populism? Populism is democratic. Right, it's you're you're giving in to what the masses want. What what tempers democracy is liberalism, is institutions and checks and balances and protection of minorities. And you know we see now after this whole Kavanaugh fight, we see lots of liberals in this country very angry, saying, "Oh well, you know the Senate is undemocratic, or you know we need, we need to change the Constitution because it's unfair that you know Nebraska has the same amount of senators as New York." So you know, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing illiberal tendencies. I think on the left in their response to what happened with Brett Kavanaugh, or they want to, or they want to pack the Supreme Court with more justices, like FDR tried to do. I saw that fourteen people want to try to extend it to oh. eleven or whatever the numbers are. Yeah. So those are very, in my mind, those are signs of that's kind of a left wing populism, you could say. Yeah. Because usually we associate populism with the right, True. but it occurs on the left as well. And then we're also, you know, Hungary. I think is the is the primary example of a country where. Uh, you know, was a, you know, is a member in good standing of the EU, NATO, one of the kind of successful stories of post-communist transition, but moving in a very illiberal direction, slowly becoming a one-party state where, you know, the ruling party basically controls everything, where there's very little opposition media, media pl- pl- pluralism is declining. Um, it's sort of the space for, the space for con- contention, the space to have debates about public policy issues is shrinking and it's becoming an authoritarian state. So that's kind of the, and that's, and there are parties like that across Europe and the West. And you could say Trump is a manifestation of this as well. Trump is not a small L liberal Democrat. I think if Donald Trump existed in Venezuela, he would be, you know, a Maduro or a Chavez. Fortunately, he exists in the United States and we have a very 
contentious media, very oppositional media. We have a very strong opposition party. We have lots of independent institutions. I mean, Hollywood and academia. I mean, he has no control over these things. And yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm quite optimistic about, you know, I don't, I don't think we're going to become a dictatorship under Donald Trump. It's going to be very difficult for him to pull that off. So we have internal um, problems with democracy in the West, and democracy is, is, is becoming, you could say, it's losing its luster for a lot of people. But then, you know, to contend with that, I think we have a rising alternative system, which is this kind of Chinese authoritarian capitalism, which is very attractive to people across the world. It used to be more than what we used to call the third world. They would take a lot of Chinese loans, and the Chinese didn't ask any questions about democracy and human rights, so they would just build bridges and build infrastructure, and it was a great deal if you were like an African dictator. Um, but now I think you're you know, increasingly seeing people in the West um, looking at China and saying, you know what, those Chinese, they may be a one-party communist state, but damn, they get things done. And look at the GDP growth, it's double digits. Mm -hmm. And they've lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, and their airports work, and their trains run on time. And, you know, Tom Friedman was saying this for a long time, but now it's a lot more people other than Tom Friedman saying it. And the Chinese are also investing heavily in Europe now. And they're, this One Belt, One Road project is extending its tentacles into Europe. And so I think, you know, for a while there, there was, you know, Fukuyama said, you know, there would be no serious contender to liberal democracy. You know, there was, there was what? There was like, you know, there's a kind of like Islamic regimes, but those have no appeal beyond the Muslim world. I think now we're seeing with China, there's a serious contender to liberal democracy. And it's this, you know, whatever you want to call the Chinese system. Um, and that, that this, this, I think, will be the main sort of vector of, of geopolitical contestation over the next 100, 200, never many years is, you know, the Chinese model or the Atlantic model, you could say. Mm. Back to the EU, though, I mean, mm -hmm. we were talking about, uh, you know, this cooperations of of powers, you know, and it seems like that's what, you know, I, mean, I don't know, Africa has one. It's the um, African Union. African Union, you know, I haven't seen one really in South America, but it, is that really the trend, though, that we're leaning towards? Is a culmination of countries or, you know, area in the world that want to pull themselves under one, one title? Regionalism? One? I'm not sure. It seems to be breaking down. I mean, the EU yeah. is certainly breaking down. I wrote a book about this. We're seeing the rise of nationalism, and countries are becoming more nationalistic, and they seem to be rejecting international cooperation, international agreements, and also regional ones, too. Um, there's a lot of serious dissension within the EU, a lot of disagreements about things, also in NATO. I mean, you know, Portugal views its security situation quite differently than Estonia does, and for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. because they, are in ge they, are in, they have totally different geography. So these institutions are, I think, facing a serious challenge. And I'm not sure that, you know, regional institutions are the future. I think um, uh, it may it may take a kind of shocking event, perhaps, to be reminded of why, you know, international alliances are important. Because I think in the in the new world, in the 21st century, it's very difficult for any one country to, to do anything by itself, even the United States, even though we're the most powerful country, richest country in the world. It's very difficult for us to just get our way by brute force. Um, we can do it, but it's not the ideal objective. Mm -hmm. um, Back to you said, I mean, you just wrote a book, mm -hmm. or you just wrote a book. We mm -hmm. have a book, The End yeah. of Europe, and you were just uh, going off on, you know, just recently, how you see like this, what we call a project experiment mm -hmm. of, you know, this regional, uh, regional culmination of powers, mm -hmm. just, you know, not failing, but, you know, you know, whether it's, you know, the policies that they all try to enact and invoke together, it just couldn't pull it in. It just couldn't make it. And you see, you actually see it ending, or do you see, you know, like you said, the, the fact of this European cooperation happening and being there is, is huge and massive. Mm. You look in history because, yep. you know, was it the past? No, when did Europe ever have, you know, a big culmination of cooperation? Not, not, not until the end of World War II. I mean, there hasn't been a, a war in Europe since then, mm -hmm. although now there is with the Russians in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I mean, like you said, you see these nationalist leaders rise up. And, you know, I know Turkey, like in a in a regional sense, in a military sense, you know, protection-wise, it's great power to annex and bring into the EU, but values. Mm, yeah. How do you put uh, um, Erdogan, I forgot his first name. Erdogan. Erdogan. Er Recep, Recep. Recep Tide Erdogan. Type how, how do Erdogan. you bring him in, or not bring him in, but, you know, add those uh, those values into the EU? And, I mean, they have the biggest problem with that, but they can also, with the migration. Migration mm -hmm. is such a huge, yeah. huge factor with Europe right now. 
with Syria, I mean, it's going all the way into Afghanistan and Pakistan. You see individuals and groups trying to get to Europe. You know, what is drawing those people into Europe, first of all? And, you know, is migration, like the number one immigration mm. itself, uh, just something that's pulling Europe down? I think um, most people go to Europe because it's rich and the standard of living is high and people know that. And particularly with, uh, you know, people have always known that in those par- in the other parts of the world, in the periphery, in the Middle East or in Africa. But with the rise of, you know, cell phone technology, smartphones, it's much easier to see mm-hmm. how nice people are living relative to you. And it's also easier to travel and to get places. And so that's contributed to it. Um, and I do think migration is probably the, the major um, crisis that Europe will be dealing with. Um, not only because the people who are coming to Europe come from such radically different cultures and it's harder for them to integrate. Um, It's different than the American immigration story. People coming from Latin America are much more culturally similar to Americans. If you can even say there's, you know, one type, there's no one type of American. We are a very diverse country. And so that therefore makes it easier for people from Latin America to come and to integrate into our society because we are better we are an immigrant society ourselves, and, and the cultural differences between people coming from Central America and Mexico from you know, native-born Americans, I think, are much smaller than the cultural differences between you know, an Afghan or a Syrian and a German or a Dutch person. So these are vast cultural differences. The, the religion is a huge thing. These are Muslims. They're coming to countries that are largely Christian. That's a huge cultural gap. People from Latin America are mostly Christian themselves coming to a Christian country. That's another reason why I think we do a better job at at assimilating our immigrants than Europeans do. And then there's the economic issue, which is that America has a very um, uh, loose labor market. It's easier to get a job here. You can work off the books or, you know, the minimum wage is much lower if there even is one in certain states. The federal minimum wage is lower. It's easier easier to work and build yourself up in America than it is if you're coming to Sweden, where it's a very tight labor market, the, there really isn't much need for low-skilled labor in a lot of these European countries. So all these things make it very difficult for European societies to assimilate the people who are coming in these mass immigration waves. So that's a, that's a difficult problem, and European societies have, have, have trouble with, with dealing with it. And then on top of that, you have the reaction, and the reaction to this mass immigration has been... Um, basically a far-right resurgence, and we're seeing that across Europe, I would say, beginning with Brexit. Brexit was mostly, if mostly Brexit was uh, happened because British people wanted less immigration. You then have Marine Le Pen, the far-right leader, in, although far-right is a weird term to use because a lot of her supporters are former communist voters. You could say the nationalist leader, Marine Le Pen. She doubled her father's support in 2017. Her father got 17% of the vote in 2002 when he ran for president. She got 34, 15 years later. In Germany, we have the alternative for Deutschland, a nationalist right-wing party. For the, it got 13%. It's now, it's the second biggest party, sorry, third biggest party in the German parliament. According to some polls, the second biggest party in the country. This is the first time since really the 1950s that you've seen a far-right party in the German Bundestag. And given that it's Germany, it obviously frightens a lot of people, Mm -hmm. as it should. In Sweden, we just saw a couple weeks ago, the Sweden Democrats, which is a party that has its origins in the neo-Nazi movement in that country, they got about 17 or 18 percent. They're the third biggest party in Sweden. This is almost entirely due, in my opinion, to the refugee crisis of 2015. If that hadn't happened, I don't think any, I think Brexit wouldn't have happened. Marine Le Pen wouldn't have gotten the support that she's gotten, AFD, probably would have maybe, maybe it would have gotten into parliament, but it would have just cleared the hurdle. Sweden Democrats wouldn't be where they are. And I could get, I could list you six other, you know, phenomena across Europe, other parties that are becoming more powerful. So this is one of the consequences of this migration wave. And, you know, it's not going away because if you look at population growth in Africa, if you look at glo- the effects of global warming, if you look at political instability in the Middle East, all these factors that are creating migration, creating outward pressures on people to leave their countries and go to Europe, those factors aren't going away. Like the Middle East is not gonna be a peaceful, nice place in the near future. So as long as that persists, you're gonna have more people wanting to leave and and go to Europe. 
And so how this issue is dealt with, I think, is very, very fundamental to the future of the future security and the stability of Europe and the European Union. Well, well, how do you feel like how do you feel we should deal with that? Like it's a for me, it's a morality. Yeah, it's a morality question versus an outcome question. Well, I think there are um, there are um, good intentions. Yeah. And you can have good intentions, but you can have bad consequences for everyone. I think Chancellor Merkel had good intentions in 2015 when she opened up Germany's doors to about one and a half million people. But the consequences haven't been very good. It's, it's destabilized Europe. I don't think it's been very good for a lot of the people who've come into Europe. Most of them don't have jobs still, and they probably won't get them for the foreseeable future. So I think these are very difficult questions, and oftentimes you have people on the extremes of either side who paint it as a very simple black and white issue. You have people on the left who would just say, well, you have to let everyone in, even if many of these people aren't refugees, even if they're just, even if they're economic asylum, even, sorry, even if they're economic migrants. These are people who are not, you know, in physical danger. They just want to, and I don't blame them. I mean, they want a, a job that pays more, so they come to Europe. And there are people who would say we have to basically let all these people in and uh, any sort of cultural concern that they won't fit in, that, are, that, that they won't adapt to our culture, that they might change our culture in ways we don't like. Those questions are racist, inherently racist. And then you have people on the, on the, you know, the other side of the argument who say, well, we have to build walls and we have, can't let any of them in and you know, Muslims can't assimilate at all and we have to keep them out and they're contagion, they're diseased. And I think you know this is unfortunately for too long how this debate has played out in mm -hmm. Europe, and that there wasn't a sensible middle ground. And I think finally now, we're, because we've seen the consequences of this, we've seen what happens when you don't have a responsible middle ground that's both, you know, um, humanitarian and and concerned about morality and human rights and uh, wants to fulfill those obligations while at the same time balancing it with just very practical considerations. I think that's what we need. We need a kind of hard-headed moral position. And I think now we're, you know, there are political leaders in Europe who get it and who are coming around to that. Um, so that's how I come at it. I come at it, I'm kind of fairly in the, in the middle, I would say, of that, of that debate. No, I mean, um, I think with this being a neoconservative, is that what you would classify yourself? No, neo God, I hate labels. Um, <laughs> I, classical liberal. Classical liberal, and you know, I, I had to look up the word because when I when I looked up the word, you know, before the show is like, you know, the to uh, you see like the person you get, you know, as a label, you know, you see uh, these very very not very but you know right uh, right wing kind of people like a Dick Cheney, maybe not be a neoliberal, no. but you know, tends to, to lean towards the values or ideas and have those people advise on what their policy and how they would look mm. at you know um, advising them their counsel, but. You know, that's just where the term almost liberal seems like it's been hijacked. And not, not hijacked, but like, oh, if you are on the left, you're liberal. Or in where you're liberal, or you're progressive. Mm. And, you know, where the term comes from, there's a liberal liberalism. It's like a 17th century yeah. term of just uh, coming out of the Enlightenment. Yep. On you, you defined it better than I would. How would you describe liberalism? Um, believing in individual rights, in rational rationalism, but not taken too far. The, the ability of men to reason and to find solutions to problems through reason is a liberal value. Um, basically the enlightenment principles mm -hmm. that, you know, we are, we all have rights as individuals, whether you are a religious person and you think that they come from our creator, or if you think that they, you know, that, that we're, we're endowed with them because we are human beings. We're not subservient to kings, you know, arbitrary authority. Um, those are enlightenment principles. So, I would, yeah, you go back to Adam Smith, which is the economic liberalism ar argument, you know, free markets. Uh, John Locke, um, probably the, you know, the most important liberal thinker. And then the founders of the American Republic. I mean, that was the, f the first liberal democracy is the United States. But it seems that's affected, like, our human rights mm. and how we see people in... You know, people use, use the word tribalism, but, you know, the black and white picture, you just went with Europe. Mm. I mean, Europe's a little way farther down the line than we are in the United States, but, you know, it's black and white on how you see something, how you see a topic, yeah. how you see an object from on college campuses to, you know, our politics now. Yeah. You know, with, with the Kavanaugh thing yeah. it was kind of silly and ridiculous. I don't care what sure, she's going to say. I don't care what he's going to say. I'm voting for this. Right. There's a lack that. of a spectrum. Or just looking at like 
and being rational. Well, there's just no empathy and there's no understanding that, you know what, maybe Ms. Ford is telling the truth. And maybe Brett Kavanaugh is also telling the truth. Maybe both of them were telling compelling stories. Um, and they're not evil people. And they're both, uh, you know, fine people in a very difficult situation. And they're being used, frankly, for political purposes. And, you know, I frankly found a lot more sympathy and understanding coming from conservatives towards Ms. Ford. People saying, you know what, something certainly probably happened to her. I think she might be mistaken about who it was. There's a lot of inconsistencies with her story, but I'm not going to demonize her as a person. I saw a lot more of that, frankly, coming from the right than I did from the left, which was basically without any, you know, no corroboration, no evidence. We're just going to demonize this Brett Kavanaugh. He's a white guy. I mean, the prevalence of the term white man in all of the attacks over the past two weeks on Brett Kavanaugh was incredible. What does that have to do? The fact that he's a man, yes, because you're talking about sexual assault. What does his oh, skin color have to do with any of this? That was so prevalent and very disturbing to me. Um, and I just didn't see the same sort of sympathy and understanding from people on the left. They just um, they saw an enemy and they pounced. And I thought it was despicable, frankly, the tactics that they used. And I'm someone who's very, as you know, very critical of Donald Trump and did not vote for him. I endorsed Hillary Clinton. But the behavior of the last two weeks of the left, the Democratic Party, and frankly, many people in the media who, it's hard for me to think of a, of a story in my lifetime, I think, where the media dropped, more blatantly dropped any pretense of neutrality than in covering this saga and just seeing journalists on Twitter and frankly, you know, newspaper reporters just completely siding with one narrative and one side over another and, and, and dropping their responsibility to be skeptical, which is what you're supposed to be when you're a journalist, is to be skeptical, just swallowing everything that the Democrats gave them and not even paying any attention to any of the evidence that might contradict their, their, their theses. It was really, I think, a radicalizing moment for a lot of people, frankly. And I can tell you just among my own colleagues and friends, people, who, again, who are centrist, center-right, but despise Trump and what he's done to the, you know, the way he behaves and what the Republicans have become under him. I've basically moved back to the middle ground now. And, you know, I, I frankly don't see much of a moral difference between Trump and his opponents at this point. I think Cory Booker has shown himself to be, you know, just as demagogic and unconcerned with facts as Donald Trump. Yes. And I think a lot of people, I think, you know, I think we're going to see it in November, actually. I think the Democrats really overplayed their hands with this. And we've been hearing for, you know, ever since Trump came into office, oh, his approval ratings are so low and there's going to be a blue wave. And I get it. Democrats are angry and they, you know, they had more momentum going into this. But wow, I think that the Republican base has been fired up by this. And not just Republicans. I think just anecdotally, again, just talking to people, people who aren't that political, people who are, you know, planning to vote for Democrats or, you know, you know, I, I'm, I'm in a small circle where pretty much everyone I know doesn't like Donald Trump, whether they're Republicans or Democrats or conservatives or liberals. Hearing from a lot of them, they've just looked at the the actions and the events of the past two weeks, and they're, um, they're really mad at what the Democrats did. I mean, from, from that to college campuses to, you know, people seeing immigration or, you know, if you don't see my side, if you don't see – that this is not right, kind of, because the good intentions are there. The, I want this person to be looked after. A lot of these people are minorities, right. and they, they never had the soapbox to stand up and speak on to have a voice heard. But we see, you know, when that hasn't happened for a while, people, like any human trait, we take advantage of it, and we boost and boost and muster as much as we can behind our cause. But now there's violence that's enacted in it, or, you know, discussion and discourse is just completely yeah. out the door. To to have a opposing factor of somebody, I can say that you know even being in New York, like I, I have friends of mine, I, I got to watch what I say. Mm -hmm. I, I no one will have a discussion with me mm -hmm. on the topic. Like, I just there's no way that you could that you could see this other way. Why why would you yeah. think outside the box? And it, there's like a I probably get in trouble using this word like a retardation of language when you see someone say mm -hmm. like with you know Donald Trump is a dictator. He's no. probably not a I say he's not a fascist. He's a golfer. That's that's my line. <laughs> that's my line on him. Um, it, it, it it does it, save it. You know, we yeah. used to use language to socially ostracize people in our culture. Mm -hmm. You know, and so tribe, like, it was you know disease thousands of years ago. So people were like, oh, this guy's gonna get us sick in our village. Like we can't have him in right. here. 
But now, I mean, with language, we can use that to keep people out. You know, we just don't see have good values, but you got to let them speak and yeah. you got to let them say like, wow, let's really let the good ideas rise to the top. And mm-hmm. this is just a terrible idea right here. Okay. This guy's talking about, you know, I don't want black people here. I don't like gays. It's just a bad idea. No, yeah. no one sees or believes that, or there's not a majority that sees that side. And people think, you know, the far right's on the rise. Um, Nazis, every, they're, no. they're, they're not everywhere. No, they're there though. They exist. Yeah. Let their bad ideas. Let what's the guy who lives in D.C. He's um, he got punched in the face. Richard Spencer. Richard Spencer. He's Richard Spencer. Yeah. He's not pushing or moving anything. The no. majority of Americans aren't turning all of a sudden. They don't like black people. They don't right. want to be associated with black people. And there's right. segregation on their rise. Like, right. It doesn't happen. No, I think there's a lot of hysteria, frankly, and I get it. You know, Trump is a shock to the system. We've never had a president like this before. It's um. It's strange. It's frightening. And uh, I think, you know, I don't want him to be president anymore. I would like him to be replaced with someone who's not so impulsive and amoral and, you know, the whole list of adjectives I could use. But I think in order to do that, you have to be very, uh, you you have to be a smart opposition. And you have to understand why it is that people voted for him. And you have to convince them and persuade them not to vote for him again. And it's really hard to persuade people of something if you don't even talk to them. And if you just look down on them and call them a bunch of names. And I really worry that the opposition in this country, which I, you know, for a while, I guess until the last two weeks, considered myself a part of. Now I'm really, in, you know, just completely politically homeless. But I don't think that the opposition... Politically homeless. Yeah, I don't think the opposition in this country, I don't know if they want to win. Because they're not acting like it. They're not acting like people who want to be winners. They're acting like people who just, and I, this applies to the, not just the Democratic Party, but people in the media, uh, at the New Yorker magazine, where there was an up in a, a revolt over simply having Steve Bannon appear on stage at their festival. It's in culture, in academia, in Hollywood. They just want to spit on people who disagree with them and, you know, look their noses down at them. And, you know, okay, fine. It's funny to laugh at Trump supporters, I guess, but... He's president of the United States, and I frankly think he's going to win re-election at this point in time. He would wow. win. He, oh, absolutely. And he would look if the election was held tomorrow. He would win. Yeah, I've heard that from a lot of people. All he has to do is show just show videos on repeat of these protesters trying to bang down the doors of the Supreme Court, screaming at senators in hallways. I mean, that's a winning campaign right there. So look, if the left and the opposition wants to you know behave this way, I guess it's cathartic. I don't see how it convinces people in the middle. Or people who voted for Donald Trump, not to do so again. I think it just makes them more defensive of the position that they have. It makes them feel, oh my God, like you know, that's the opposition. Trump can just point his finger and say it's me or them. And frankly, a lot of people are going to say, fine, you know, I don't like you, but I'm. It's I can't go with that. So I, you know, that's my advice to people on the other side of you know of Trump who don't want him to win re-election is to be much smarter about how you do things and you know whining about you know the senate the senate's unfair the constitution is unfair the supreme court's unfair the russians stole the election from hillary i mean it's just it's all these excuses and it's not actually productive it's not doing anything towards you know making the country better or uh, offering a viable alternative to donald trump it's just you're becoming him i mean michael avenatti is sort of like the ugly funhouse mirror of trump he's trump from the left. He's a reality television show, you know, provocateur, a shameless self-promoter, um, an amoral, you know, charlatan. Um, I think he actually, and some people, many people have, have commented on this, if he hadn't gotten involved in this whole thing with Brett Kavanaugh, then they might have been able to actually stop his nomination. I think a lot of people were willing to perhaps give more credence to Ms. Ford's story until... Avenatti and the other story involving a woman at Yale that was published in the New Yorker was these other accusations that started coming in through the transom that were just obviously false. I mean, the minute that Julie Swetnick woman went on television, I think it was clear that she was lying through her teeth and the claims that she was making about, you know, rape gangs and whatnot. I mean, once those accusations started coming through, it became much easier for the Republicans just to say, all right, now you're launching a smear campaign this from, against this guy. Uh, Christina Blasey Ford, she said, with the rape gangs? or is this? No, no, that was accusing? Swetnick. That was Avenatti's client, okay. a woman named Julie Swetnick, who for some reason 
was a freshman in college and going to parties with high school students in suburban Maryland where Brett Kavanaugh was as a 15-year-old. I mean, just the, her story was just bunk. And then she, she was interviewed on, MSN, on NBC or MSNBC, whatever it was, and um, it was clear just listening to her that she was making it up. And most people could see that. But because all these accusations got conflated, right, it wasn't just Ford, who I think was a credible person, conceivable that she was telling the truth. Her accusations, her potentially credible accusations were being diluted and conflated with some obviously preposterous nonsense that was being peddled by the likes of Michael Avenatti. And so he, you know, I think is largely to blame for the failure to prevent Brett Kavanaugh from getting on the Supreme Court. I think if if the only accusation that had been public was Ford's, then you might have you, you would have seen less um, you know, people like Jeff Flake and, and Susan Collins and others, they might have felt less compelled to, to support Kavanaugh. But because in the public imagination it just it, it, it very clearly became a character assassination campaign. Absolutely. It was more of a what would you describe it as? You know, we're bringing this guy on, and we want to look at him if he has, you know, the morality or you know even you know the demeanor to sit on the Supreme Court. We're gonna get there, ask him a few questions, mm. and then determine. And then it almost came like a trial. He was on trial, right? Not even about to be on the Supreme Court, but if he had, you well, know, it was impossible because then so the, you accuse the guy of being a, a leader of a rape gang in the national media for 10 days, and you have leading members of the opposition party call him all these terrible things and say he's guilty. We used to have presumption of innocence, but not, apparently not when it comes to this. And then he testifies, and he's angry about it. And then they say, oh, well, he's, you know, he's shown a uh, horrible temperament. He, he so it was, this, it was this, you know, die if you do or die if you don't kind of situation. There was no way out of it at that point. <laughs> it's, the, it's the reverse <laughs> gloves on OJ, right? You, you, uh, you show that, like with the gloves on OJ, you show that, okay, potentially this one thing can prove him innocent. Well, now you've got, well, this one person lied, so why can't the rest of it be lies? And you, you've created that mindset inside the inside the public. Yeah, yeah, and it's I think unfortunately. Um, this is this is going to put a pall over the Supreme Court. I think you're going to constantly hear whenever a decision comes down that uh, people on the left don't like, they will say it's illegitimate. And you're already seeing the kind of delegitimization of our institutions, and it's it's sad and it's dangerous, and it's coming from, uh, ironically, the people who for the past two years since Donald Trump was elected president have been lecturing us, and you know usually correctly that. Um, we have democratic norms in this country. They need to be preserved, and Donald Trump is undermining them. He's undermining our democratic norms by, you know, attacking law enforcement, by attacking the media, saying the press is the enemy of the people. These things, you know, degrade our democracy. Well, the same people who have been, you know, lecturing us on these things for the past two years were some of the first to come out and basically say, oh, well, Brett Kavanaugh, he's guilty of, you know, he, he is a rapist or he is a sexual assaulter without evidence, without any corroborating evidence. And um, that's why I say that I don't. I, I think Trump is basically the the risk that you have if you are an opponent of Donald Trump is becoming like him. And if you let him into your head and you let him dominate your thoughts and you let him control your mind, like a lot of people in this country have, then you risk becoming like that what you despise. And I've seen that in so many people, so many of my colleagues and friends, frankly who have become just as racist, although to different types of people. They've become racist towards, you know, white men, okay? They've become just as authoritarian. They've become just as illiberal. They've become just as close-minded as Donald Trump is and as Donald Trump's supporters are. And it's just a really unhealthy place to be. Yeah, I think the, a big one, too, is um, like anti-Israel. And I don't know how much of it is like layered in anti-Semitism. I mean, especially when you think about it's coming from the U.S. or you know people that are on the left. But would you say there's any like anti-Semitism layered into it? Uh, it's very complicated. Um, I think some some people come at the issue of Israel as anti-Semites. Some of them don't like Jews for whatever reason, and they see Israel as the Jewish state, and so they're going to oppose Israel and they're going to accuse it of you know 
being like a Nazi state. You know, that is an inherently anti-Semitic thing to say. You don't compare the Jewish state, the people who are the victims of Nazis. You don't compare them to Nazis. I mean, you can criticize Israel. It's a country. It makes mistakes. It commits human rights abuses. It, there's all sorts of things wrong with Israel. But when you leap to the Nazi comparison, it's clearly uh, meant to, to antagonize Jews and to, and to annoy them and to traumatize them. Um, and then I think a lot of people on the left, they're not even really, they're, they're not consciously anti-Semitic. They're coming at this because they see the world in terms of power relationships. And they always want to be identified with who they see as being powerless or victims of global machinations or whatever. They want to support the underdog. And so in their mind, they see the Israeli, they see the Middle East as being a, a, a situation where Israel is this big, powerful country and it's oppressing Palestinians, and therefore, you know, we are going to support the Palestinians, which is not, you know, I support a Palestinian state as well. I think where it can go too far is, is um, where it's not realistic is when you're calling for, you know, a one-state solution. When you're calling for the abolition of Israel, when you're saying that, you know, Israel should just be part of Palestine, it should be one country, um, I think it's really historically ignorant. I think you're forgetting why Israel was created. Uh, well, there are multiple reasons. One reason was obviously after the Holocaust, but also, you know, the Jews have just as much a right to a country as everyone else. You know, if the Palestinians get to have a country, why can't the Jews have one? If the Egyptians have a country, if the Ghanaians have a country, if the Chinese have a country, if all these people have countries, then surely the Jews, who are the victims of the greatest genocide in human history, then surely they should get their own country, no? And so I, that's why I think anti, anti-Zionism is almost always inherently anti- anti-Semitic, because you're singling out one people for discrimination. And if you were doing that to any other people, then you know, if you're saying you know, gay people shouldn't be allowed to be married, everyone else can get married except for gay people, then we would say that that's homophobic. If you were saying that all these rights should be given to everyone except black people, then you would say that's racist. Well, if you're saying everyone gets to have a country except the Jews, it's hard for me to see how that isn't anti-Semitic. I guess you know there are some people who have like a, you know there 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 are, there are people who oppose n- nation states in any way, shape, or form, and they believe in you know global government. Fine, that's sort of an intellectual abstraction. Mm-hmm. And if if no one gets to have a country, then fine. But like in the real world, we have <laughs> countries, and they're going to be there, and they're not going away. So that being said, and that being reality, you have a country, a Jewish state. You know what do we do with it? And I would say, well, it, it should exist, and it should also find a way to, you know, stop this occupation of other people who aren't citizens, the Palestinians. They, this can't go on. This is not an acceptable, so, uh, an acceptable situation. And I think most Israelis would agree. They want to disentangle themselves. They don't want to occupy Palestinian territory. They don't want to send their sons and daughters, you know, to patrol Palestinian neighborhoods. They do it because it's because the Arabs won't accept the presence of a Jewish state and they're missed, and they haven't for a very long time. And until, until that changes, until the Palestinians um, are able to you know, basically say, yes, we will live side by side peacefully with you, and we're not going to make claims on your territory, and we're not going to shoot rockets into your cities, until that situation changes, then I don't see how, you, I don't see how the status quo changes. Um, yeah, I think everybody's in that area on both sides is kind of fed up in terms of like yeah it's peace hasn't happened yet we can't get cooperation on both sides like we're just kind of over it we're just going to forget about it like in like letting it go to where the polarizing sides get to set the issue and factor you know netanyahu is much more on the right and leaning well okay there's no factor i got president trump support over here to do what i want do what i please there's nobody on the other side i mean you have hamas over here you have the palestinian authority over here Palestinian authorities really pissed off. I don't think anybody talks with Hamas and because they're a, considered a terrorist uh, organization. So no, nothing gets solved. And it's getting to the point where, you know, maybe Israel just might push all the way in and it, there won't be another side. It's, there's no there's no one there to represent the other side. I think there is potentially a risk that you could see maybe um, an annexation of the West Bank. But um not in the near term. I think you would have to have a real fundamental shift in the Israeli polity. Mm-hmm. Um, it'd have to be. It would have to become a much more religious country, a country that's le- you know that's less secular, that actually wants these territories in the West Bank to become part of a greater Israel, and that could happen. 
that could happen in the you know I think it would be in a in a in a, in a couple decades before that happened. But um, I think these are very you know this is uh, it's an intractable problem. I think um, you know you have you have two sides that have uh, a territorial dispute. And they're fighting over the same piece of land, and that's always been, you know, with religious with religious yeah. overtones to it. So yeah. it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very tricky situation that no one's been able to solve. <laughs> so uh, it's a greater, uh, greater discussion to human rights that we've been going off too. I mean, mm-hmm. that's a, you know, placed in by, you know, post World War II. Put this country in; they have a very liberal based background and based policies of the country itself. They're not going in saying, oh, we're going to take over this land. They've respected the land. There's been these wars. They go back and forth. And, you know, I don't look at the U.N. or, you know, the E.U. as, you know, failures or complete failures. They were experiments that happened. We tried. We gave them a chance. We had this cooperation go on. But now we have that problem. You know, use a perfect example is the U.N. Security Council. Okay, we want to go in somewhere. We want to get something done. Okay, one country is always going to do no, whether it's mm. Russia or the U.S. or, you know, U.S. ally with these with the those EU countries that are in the Security Council. And the same thing goes with China now. China kind of sides with, sides with Russia. We want to make a overall agreement on, okay, this has to get done. We have to go cooperate. I mean, you look at uh, Myanmar right now with, you know, everybody's praising uh, – Aung San San Suu Kyi. They're not praising her anymore. I think they've (laughs) kind of given up on her. But yeah, but and you know she kind of got in um, with with going with Myanmar. They have a uh, not military dictatorship, but they had one. Mm. And but the military still has a very big big sway, or Mm. they're their own idea or policy or factor within the country. And you know now, would you say there's a genocide happening and going? I am not following what's happening in in Burma. I believe is what is what. Um, Former Burma, now Myanmar. Yeah, I think I insist on calling it Burma because <laughs> they changed. You know, it was the military junta that changed the name. Yeah, um, I haven't. It's just, there's only so much I can do every re, read every mm-hmm. day, so I haven't been following what's what's been happening in that part of the world. Well, more of my point, I'm going to get. I wanted to get mm. to in here and uh, have you comment on is, you know, the human rights, the human rights of the situation, yeah. giving everybody a sway and a chance, you know, no matter their their background and discourse and. How do we project those liberal ideas, those liberal – and we talked about democracy earlier, that is it going to be democracy everywhere? Because we've tried to inject it in every place. We've tried to shove it in here and there, and mm. it doesn't always work. Yeah. Well, I think you've definitely seen a backlash to sort of democracy promotion and the notion that America should be you know, spreading democracy uh, or that America is a – um, has the right to stand up for such things and to, and to sort of uh, espouse those ideals. And I think it began with President Barack Obama, frankly. I think Obama saw America as, frankly, you know, too corrupt for the world or, or too sinful for the world, whereas Trump sees the world as, as too sinful for America. And so not, and, and in both of those understandings, the prescription is the same, which is basically America should come home. And I think that's what we're seeing. That's what we've been seeing for the past couple of years. You saw Obama come into office, you know, basically saying America is not an exceptional country, um, trying to reduce our influence abroad militarily, um, you know, reduce our footprint in various parts of the world. And it was he came in as sort of a reaction against, I think, the Iraq war. But also he came from a a foreign policy tradition that was a kind of left-wing foreign policy tradition that um, saw the United States and American power as being, as causing more problems as opposed to solving problems. And though he saw the presence of America as often a problem in and of itself. Whereas Trump comes at it, you know, again, from the opposite side, where he sees as the world being this kind of jungle that America shouldn't step foot into because it's full of dangerous and scary monsters and friends who say they're our friends but rip us off and not worth our time and so that is what i think is happening and i think it's a very um ominous future because mankind has never had a better 80 years in the past 80 years and we're very fortunate to have grown up in this and i know everyone says that every every generation thinks that they're, you know, they're living through the best times. But you know what? If you were living in the 1930s or the 1940s, you would think this is this is the worst 
uh, time in human history. And you know what? You'd be right. It's mm-hmm. hard to think of a time when worse things happened to mankind or that men did to one another than occurred in that interwar period. Um, and we've been able to prevent those horrible things from happening again since World War II, I would argue, because it goes back to this notion of the liberal world order, which is democracies working with other democracies to maintain the peace, to spread liberal values, to support individual rights, to support you know uh, democratic values in countries where they don't exist, to stay together, to restrain or, or oppose those countries that oppose that liberal world order, whether it's you know the Soviets or the communist Chinese or the, you know the, the Venezuela of Hugo Chavez or the Iranian regime. Um, and, it's very, and, and, and that's what's basically held this world order together since World War II. And I fear that the United States is retreating from that, retreating from that um, notion of what role it should play in the world. And what's going to replace it is not going to be something nice. It's not going to be, you know, the UN General Assembly where everyone just kind of holds hands and sings kumbaya. It's not how international relations works. It'll create a vacuum, and that vacuum will be filled by bad actors. It'll be filled by the Chinese in Asia. It'll be filled by the Russians in Europe. It'll be filled by the Iranians in the Middle East. I mean, you can you can point to any illiberal, authoritarian, revisionist power that is very hungrily looking at its neighborhood, waiting to pounce, waiting for the United States and its allies to withdraw. Well, what do you think is going to happen to the rights of the humans in a world like that? I think it would be terrible. I mean, say what you will about America and the way it behaved during the Cold War. And, you know, obviously we've committed many crimes in our history as a, as, as a country, both against our own people and against other people. I'm not denying that. I would just ask what alternative is there to a world that's led by the United States. There are many alternatives, but are any of those are any of those alternatives better than the one that we've maintained for the last 80 years since World War II? I defy anyone to say yes to that. A world in which China is the leading power in cahoots in cooperation with Russia and Venezuela and Iran is not going to be a world where the individual human rights of women or gay people or Taiwanese people or anyone uh, are better protected than the system that we currently have. And I just think that that's really not up for debate. It's it's fascinating to me because it's so important here in the U.S., the, the rise of the individual rights. And then we also want to we also want to scream for freedom of some of these other countries. But then in allowing the rise of some of these powers, we're we're bringing in the lack of that we're bringing in that lack of freedom where we're it's like these two opposing thoughts that people have they don't see the they don't see the outcome that they're creating from from such you know a positive viewpoint of some of these states but look if china was a democracy then i wouldn't have yeah. a problem with it becoming a more you know powerful and assertive country just like you know germany being a rich country today doesn't worry anybody because germany is not a, a militaristic racist dictatorship like it was in 1939. Um, but China's not a liberal democracy. It's an authoritarian one-party state uh, that you know is currently putting I don't know, a million Muslims in concentration camps was the latest story I saw with Uyghurs. China, I mean, yeah. Uyghurs. it's a dystopian. I mean, you, want, you know, it, it's like a 1984 kind of type situation. So um, I, there is an impulse among many people on the left, I think, to oppose American power because they think that, again, going back to Obama, they think that we've, you know, we're sinful. Who are we to tell other people how to live their lives? We've, you know, Vietnam and we supported, you know, Pinochet in Chile or whatever. Um, they're making room for the rise of illiberal regimes that will uh, make the world a worse place. And it's, just, I mean, global power in this sense is, is a zero sum game. The more that we and our allies give up, the more our adversaries will claim. So I think we need to do two things. One, we need to resist those powers from rising, and we need to contain them so that they're not causing trouble for their neighbors or meddling in our democracies or whatnot. And we also need to do what we can to make those countries more more liberal. And it's very difficult. I'm not expecting China or Russia to become liberal democracies overnight. But there are people in those countries who are standing up for liberal values, for individual rights, for democracy, who don't like the nationalistic, aggressive, 
you know, decisions that their leaders are taking. And it's our, I think it's our duty as Americans to support those people and those voices. Yeah, it's, it's people want to, they've been naturally known to migrate out of those places. And that's where you've seen, you know, a lot of places in the West just pull in all these people who want to get out and they're very, you know, technologically savvy or they're beacons of human rights. I mean, I know you're a big proponent of like, gay rights and I know you have what's going on in Russia, which crazier is, um, I don't know, what do you call it? You know, Chechnya, the mm -hmm. region down there. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, there's like gay people just don't exist. They're not they're being killed. And there's just no pol no no rules or regula regulation, but you say, hey, this is a law. It's like, oh, yeah, they're not real people. I mean, if they were real people, then they would exist, but they yeah. don't exist. So, I mean, the stories of people escaping there. But why aren't that, we challenging them? Like, why aren't we challenging that? Oh, we certainly are. I mean, they're, they're, uh, the State Department definitely released a statement, and there might be there might be cooperation that you're not hearing about to bring people out of those countries to spirit them out. There's like a kind of underground, a gay underground railroad to you know, rescue these people. But I think this goes again to the crucial difference between liberal democracies and authoritarian states, which is that liberal democracies respect the dignity of individuals. And they understand that every individual human being has dignity and worth. Whereas a totalitarian regime or an authoritarian regime sees people as basically, you know, tools in uh, or you know they're 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 tools in state building and they can be crushed and you know you can uh, that's how that's how the Russians see people in Chechnya that's how the Chinese see their own people they don't see them as citizens who have rights that cannot be violated by the government they're objects to be used in building a great state and that's a fundamental difference between us and our and our illiberal adversaries. It, it's, it's weird because, you know, I'm someone who, who tries to rationale the future, you know, someone who says, um, how are humans going to be 200 years from now, 500 years from now? How can we better us into the future? And I, and I think to look at it logically, if, you're, if you want to see yourself 500 years from now, it's, it's what's going to get us there. What, what are we going to do to create that utopian, that utopian world? How are we going to um, bring humans to a better place? But so part of me, you know, there's a dichotomy in me where I understand another culture. I understand where they come from and how they were raised. And, and I don't want to take away that identity from them. But I also understand that there are certain principles and values and morals that get us to that point that we're trying to reach. And by allowing people to maybe have some of these potential values and, and, and the way that they treat other human beings, you're then – you're bringing down the whole of our – of our society to reach that higher viewpoint. So it's, it's like this battle that I feel because, because I, I understand, but I don't think that we, we can allow anything like that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we want human beings to move at the rate and pace that technology and all this to connect and come together, but we're still dealing with human beings. And like you said, okay, we can support people there. We can slowly pull, you know, these you know, people out who are being oppressed or, you know, again, but they're gonna leave those places. And those places aren't becoming better places. Russia being a prime mm. example. And, you know, people coming out of China could be that same case, but it, it's just going to take time. You can't just force and go in with guns blazing that we're going to change the policy and change the views of all these people. It, it's going to take time. And, you know, is there anything else but, you know, supporting those people and, you know, um, besides the what you said, uh, not prevention, but, you know. Um, well, no, it's also it's, it's providing a good example. And I think that's why, you know, what's happening in our country right now is so dispiriting because it. It's, we're, we're, not, we're not providing a good example of what the leader of the free world should be mm -hmm. behaving. I mean, this is not, this is not um, the example that I think people living in you know, Iran or Saudi Arabia or Russia, um, you know, our, our, our country doesn't really look like a beacon of, of liberty and, and, and you know, human rights at this moment. We look kind of silly and pathetic on the world stage, unfortunately. And that's a lot of blame to go around for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm worried about some of the younger generations too, Gen yeah. Z, millennials. Like yeah. what's the world going to look like yeah. for us 30 years from now? Yeah, and I don't think that. Yeah, I don't think we're doing a very good job of instilling these values in the future generations and explaining to them, you know, what democracy means, what human rights mean, what America's role in the world should be. Well, it's so multifaceted. I mean, you were talking about it with the migration going into Europe, and you know, when you study. Not just climate change, but you know the way the the planet is. If you want to say those colder regions, that anything that's touching or uh, connecting to the uh, the Arctic Circle is just going to be, you know, you know, global warming is going to be a great thing for those parts of the world. It's going to be much cooler. 
It's not much cooler. It's much warmer than it was. You know, Russia. You see, you know, praising. Yeah, global warming, good for us. It's gonna. It's not gonna be so miserably cold for the entire year. The places. But then, you know, again, you see those. I don't know where I was getting with that one. I lost that one. Oh, it, time. Um, okay. Any uh, last ones? Any last things? We're on time. No. Yeah. Um, hmm. No, I, I, I knew we were really down and down on the gloomy, but yeah. give us uh, some uplifting thing oh. to, to lead us and close us out on about. <laughs> um, well, I would just say that I, um, I'm less pessimistic than I was, than I was um, when Trump was elected. I'll put it that way. I think we've seen the resilience of our institutions and our democracy, and people are very engaged politically. And they're paying more attention to what's going on in the world, and I think we'll, you know, I I think we'll get through this. It might take a while, and um, it might be painful and long, but uh, we've been through a lot worse as a country than what we're going through now. That has been the interesting thing. Everybody is actually talking about it a lot more mm-hmm. and interested in what's going on yeah. and why it's happening. We're just having a real butting head of growing pains right yeah. now on just how to talk with each other. Mm-hmm. It is, it is a, it is well, a this is a very good, the fact that you have a podcast like this, I think, is a very good sign. I really appreciate it. And really appreciate you coming out here. <laughs> Thank you. Getting out here on this day. Um, and real quick, how can people find you? You know, you know, obviously your book, everywhere you get yeah. books. I got it on the Kindle myself. You can go to my website, jameskirchick.com. And then, uh, yeah, that's I'm on Twitter, catch. Jay Kirchick on Twitter. And, uh, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. It's a really education informative for me. I love talking public policy, international relations. So mm-hmm. this is a huge 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 pleasure for me so thank you very much and thank you for everybody for tuning in the show remember if you like this episode hit that subscribe button and you know give it a share if you thought you learned something or something very informative on the subject that someone else can learn out there and make sure you go check out uh jamie's page and that's what else we got we got the youtube channel go check out our videos we just toured on south america we took our sh- podcast on the road on an actual school bus that's at on the bus podcast on youtube hit the subscribe button there let us know what you think of those shows and episodes there and we got our sponsor we got green roads world the largest cbd in south florida make sure you go get yourself some cbd oil and use promo code on the bus for 15 percent discount on any and all cbd products give yourself and everyone else out there, the gift of good health today with some CBD oil. And the bus is out. Thank you so much again, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Quits is the most uh, for those who...